Hi, everyone who is joining us, joining us on the webinar. Hopefully, you can all hear me. Um, as we're waiting for everyone to get to continue logging on, if you could make sure that your microphone is on mute, you can also turn off your video function. Rather, if you have questions or comments as we go throughout, we'd appreciate it if you could type those in the chat box. And we will make time uh, at the end of our webinar to respond to all of those. So again, just make sure you turn your sound and your video off um, and keep them off for the entirety of the webinar. And we'll make time for uh, questions and comments later on. All right, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the first part of the LRA, web, LRA webinar series about writing high quality proposals. Uh, as we start, I want to you to our panel, those who will be responding to your questions and offering some tips tonight. So I'm going to first go to Bangi. Bangi, can you introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Amy. Uh, my name is Bungi Zhang. Um, I'm pleased to be part of this uh, great webinar. And I am currently assistant professor in the Department of Language, Reading and Language Arts at Syracuse University. Thanks, and Carmen? Hi, I'm Carmen Medina, and I'm part of the LRA um, board. I'm also associate professor at Indiana University. And Lenny? Hi, Amy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lenny Sanchez, and I'm a faculty member at University of South Carolina and a co-chair for Area 7, which is social, cultural, and political issues of literacy practices in and out of school. I'm happy to be a part of the webinar tonight and look forward to joining the conversation. And Marcel? Good evening, everyone. I'm Marcel Haddix. I am the 2018 conference chair for the LRA annual conference. I'm also uh, chair of the Reading and Language Arts Department uh, at Syracuse University. Welcome. I'll just briefly introduce myself as well. I'm Amy Hutchison from George Mason University, and I've just been a three-year student and a co-chair for Area 10. And Peggy. Hi everyone, this is Peggy Simmingson. I'm at UT Arlington in Texas. I'm on the technology committee and I will be helping to moderate the chat. Do um, attend to the chat and feel free to type in comments. Okay, thank you everyone. So I'll briefly review our agenda for tonight. We're going to go over um, the call for proposals. We'll discuss some of the review criteria for proposals. We'll talk about uh, responding to the conference theme. We'll discuss some of the different types of submissions for the conference. And then each of our panelists will give you some brief tips and advice for submitting proposals. And then the remainder of our time will be for questions and comments, and our panelists will respond to your questions. So again, feel free to type those in the chat box at any point throughout, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marcel to talk about submit, should you submit a proposal. So first, uh, I want to thank everyone for being on the webinar and um, you know that suggests that you have an interest in the 2018 conference and are already thinking about ideas for um, submitting and participating in this year's annual uh, conference and proposal um, review process. So the first thing, um, please read the call for proposals in its entirety and you can access the call for proposals on the LRA website. Just go to Literacy Research Association um, to access that call. Uh, you'll see a tab that says um, annual conference and you'll find both a Word and PDF document. And in that um, document, it goes over the conference theme, it goes over the types of submissions. Um, it talks about the process, the actual technical process of submitting um, the proposals through all academic 
You also want to understand the research areas, the 14 research areas. I won't go through all 14 of them now, but you can access information about that also on the website um, to find out if you have an idea for a conference proposal, um, what kinds of, um, where your proposal might best fit um, in terms of the, air, the research areas um, that we have for the organization. You'll notice with each research area, there are co-chairs, co-area chairs, who if you have questions, you might feel free to uh, reach out to those individuals. You might find that your colleagues are serving as area chairs. Um, and then there's also information in the call for proposals um, for who to contact if you have questions about that. So certainly um, we can assist, but you'll find that um, you, depending on your research that it may fall under many areas. So you wanna really think through what might be the best um, avenue for you. And what's really important is just to note that you want to think about making sure that you're submitting, if you have original work, original research that's related to literacy that you have not published elsewhere, um, that you have not submitted for publication, um, that this is a, a conference um, paper presentation is, is a publication. It is um, an, avenue, an, avenue, an, avenue for, an avenue for you to be a research study that um, has been conducted that you have findings to present on. So we can talk about that a bit more as we talk about criteria for review. Okay. Okay. With that, I will begin discussing the criteria for review. So there are a few things I want to highlight about this slide. So first, it's important to note that the criteria that you see on your screen are the criteria that reviewers are given to review your proposal. So each proposal will have three reviewers and they will provide a rating on each of these criteria. And that rating is a big part of how uh, area chairs will make decisions about accepting proposals. It is not the only uh, decision maker, but it is an important part of it. And so it is critical that you do address these criteria. And that means really making a case for the significance of your work and then um, grounding it in a theoretical rationale. And then something that uh, is, can often be difficult is providing sufficient detail on methodology and results and conclusions in a short proposal. It's limited to 1,500 words. But it is important that there is sufficient detail in those sections that reviewers are able to make a judgment about the proposal. And it's important also to point out that uh, you can add additional information in your results sections in the form of figures and tables, and those are not part of your word count. So that's another way to add some detail to your proposal. And then I'm actually going to turn it over to Marcel to address the last two criteria that you see on your screen. So uh, oftentimes people ask about the connection to the conference theme. Um, and this year's conference theme is reclaiming literacy research, centering activism, community, and love. Um, and it's, I'll just highlight some of the um, key ideas within that, within the theme um, that you want to be thinking about and how your work relates to it. Um, it asks you to think about the relationships of your work and the impact of your work to and with communities. You know, which um, theoretical perspectives um, that you are drawing on um, and methodologies that um, allow you to re-engage your research with social action um, with and not on communities. Um, how we work in solidarity and build co co coalitions with communities. Um, how we cultivate and sustain those relationships in ways that are humanizing and not harming. So when we think about the notion of activism, community, and love. Um, and we're also thinking about um, theoretical perspectives and methodologies um, that we might draw upon that really think about these issues. Indigenous, decolonizing, racial justice focused, critical race, black feminist, queer, and other humanizing methodologies and theoretical perspectives. Um, a lot of times people will say, well, what if my research doesn't fit 
the conference theme. And I'll honestly say that I have a hard time thinking about um, how you can't find a way um, to think about how your research has impact beyond just doing research for the sake of research, that you should be thinking about, especially with literacy, and for many of us that do work that is related to, to children, to people, to communities, um, how we work in relationship to, what's the action? Um, is our work action oriented? So, you know, the reviewers will be, the area chairs and the reviewers will be, as they look at, as they look at proposals, um, thinking about how these ideas are taken up, not just a superficial, you know, nod to, okay, I, I say in my proposal, I'm taking up reclaiming literacy research, but really thinking about how that's embedded across all of the other criteria, whether it's the significance to the field, whether it's the theoretical perspective, the methodological rigor, all of those things are ways in which we would be looking for how people re-engage their research with community and social action. So um, the theme is important and, they, and uh, we will be looking for that in proposals um, that are submitted. The, la the uh, last criteria is the attention to issues of equity, inclusion, and diversity. And I will say that that um, also is, is the same kind of idea that in thinking about research, uh, literacy research and where we are in this um, important moment that we wanna be thinking about um, research that is um, action oriented, that it's about change, it's about equity, it's an, about inclusion across many uh, different kinds of identities and perspectives. Um, we're thinking about epistemological and methodological inclusion and diversity. So there are many ways that we can think about how issues of equity and inclusion and diversity are attended to. But again, it's not necessarily that uh, reviewers or area chairs will be looking for that check off, but more so how it's embedded and integrated across the work that individuals do. Make sure to like. Okay, I'm going to continue, but if you're joining us, please put your mic up. That would be helpful for everyone listening. Okay. here. I want to discuss a few uh, other criteria. So we discussed the paper criteria, but in addition uh, to paper sessions, there are other types of sessions that you can submit for to the conference. And one of those are symposia and the other are alternate format sessions. So symposia are, a symposium is a collection of papers related to a unified theme or topic. And then you could submit to alternate format if you have a topic or a research approach that would be better with a different type of discussion or a different type of presentation, you can present an alternate format session. So in addition to the criteria that we've already reviewed, these two types of sessions have these three additional criteria that you see here on your screen. So specifically, uh, area chairs are looking for the coherence among the papers that they all are uh, closely related and related to the unifying theme. They're also looking at the quality of individual papers as well as the collective set of papers, but individual papers should each have their own specific focus and uh, be of high quality. And then, uh, as it mentions in the call for proposals, area chairs are really looking for some variety in how um, scholars are approaching the work, variety in the methodologies and the theoretical perspectives, and specifically variety in the institutions that um, the proposers are coming from. The, these sessions are really great for bringing together different perspectives on a topic or even different approaches to studying a topic. And um, as the program mentions, or the call for proposal mentions, area chairs are gonna give preference to 
uh, symposia proposals that are for uh, presenters from different institutions. And then I'm going to let Marcel discuss uh, the next two varieties, starting with study groups. Yes, and I and Amy, I just want to underscore what you just said. It's it's really important that with symposia that are submitted, that it shows, as Amy pointed out, um, the cross institutional affiliations and people coming from different. Um, maybe methodological or theoretical uh, perspectives all are having a shared inquiry. So we'll be looking for that. But um, the importance of having different institutional affiliations is key with that. Four criteria for study groups. Um, study groups are uh, those sessions that often, um, right now, they're held during the lunchtime hour throughout the conference. And individuals propose study groups where they want to um, go deeper into uh, talking about a specific uh, kind of, uh, a, a specific topic, area of inquiry, um, and, in, and they come for the three days across the conference, a well-organized and feasible agenda of questions and objectives to be able to study together over the course of the conference, they propose uh, qualified facilitators, people who have areas of expertise um, in the particular topic. Um, some of the study groups, uh, I always enjoy participating in the doctoral student um, study group. Uh, they've done uh, topics where they focused on humanizing pedagogy. They've done topics where they focused on um, action-oriented, um, social justice-focused um, study groups. They focused on um, how you balance um, being in community with some of the demands of um, your academic institution and responsibility. So those have always been really generative conversations. And so we're looking for a strong rationale that's grounded in relevant literature, um, a study group that is proposing an opportunity for people to think more critically about ex how to extend or think about a particular area of research um, or inquiry. Uh, so that would be key when thinking about um, submitting and proposing study groups because, um, you know, an hour during the lunch hour, uh, an hour for lunch is not a lot of time. So we want to make sure that those study groups um, are generative, um, have a strong rationale, and will generate a lot of interest from membership. The next um, area, and I've seen that some people have asked questions about this, if your research is currently a work in progress. Um, there are opportunities for you to submit. Um, this is idea for participants who are conducting research, but you should have some preliminary findings to present and discuss. So for works in progress. The roundtable sessions are great for that where people come together, um, you present. Roundtables are generally organized with um, you know, three people at a table, each having time to present their works in progress and to get, have conversation and dialogue with individuals about the work. Um, it should, should still be the presentation of original uh, research or theoretical work. Um, this is not a space to present research or theoretical work that is in the planning stages. Again, there should be some preliminary findings. This year, we're also um, piloting a poster session. Uh, a number of people have asked for opportunities to present and um, the, the works in progress. And so similar to roundtables, the criteria will be the same, uh, but the difference is you read the call for proposals uh, is the way that you know, the poster has to be set up, the criteria for that. So again, the posters, there will not be many opportunities for it. This, is, this year would be a pilot to see how that goes. Um, there are programs like the STAR program, uh, the mentoring program that has had a poster session in the past. And so we're opening this option for uh, the entire membership to see, uh, in addition to the round tables, uh, what kinds of uh, opportunities that will present for people who want the opportunity to talk about their works in progress. Okay. And finally, we're to the portion where each of our panelists will offer their top tips or best advice for writing a high quality proposal. So I'm going to start with Carmen. Sure. Um, I'm going to share two 
tips. One is of, uh, one about writing, the process of writing your proposal and something that I learned when I started in this process. Um, I used to write proposals that were very top heavy because I follow the, the ways in which the, the proposals are, um, requirements are outlined. And, um, and not as much time as explaining methodology, results, findings, and data analysis. And what I have, what I have come to learn is that the process is very cyclical. So you, you, you begin on the top, but you need to move in a cycle to make sure that your findings, as a proposal reviewer, I tend to look at, at, at methodology and data and findings before I look at the overall data to make sure that there is something there. So when you're writing your proposal, make sure that you are cycling through the different headings and, 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 and things that you have to include in it. Can I share one another? Okay, my second tip has to do with alternative sessions, which I've been doing the last five years. And it has also taken me a little bit to figure out um, much better in the last year. And I, what, what is important about alternative session is that they demand the same kind of rigor when you're writing them as when you're writing a paper. A paper. Um, and, and by that, I mean that your, your alternative session has to be grounded. The questions that you're exploring in an alternative way have to be grounded in your work and the work of those who will be doing the alternative work with you. So, uh, so make sure that you work within, I know, I know alternative sessions open up for other kinds of uh, work, but make sure that you work within and against the headings and, the, and the, what, what is expected in the traditional um, proposal to make sure that that, that, that that rigor is there. Okay, thanks Carmen. Let's move to Lenny. Sure. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, so we've been asked just to share a couple ideas up front, and, uh, and then we will um, certainly engage questions and provide answers and talk through ideas um, here in just a few moments. But uh, since alternative sessions was just mentioned, I would like to just kind of add maybe one more one more piece of advice with that. And um, for folks who are writing proposals for alternative sessions, it could be helpful if you it, near the front end of your proposal, maybe even your first few sentences, state that it is an alternative proposal. It just can be a visual, helpful reminder to viewers when reviewers are viewing many different kinds of proposals, what criteria they need to be attending to when it relates to a particular proposal, especially when it's not one that maybe is a paper or symposium. So one piece of advice is just to help remind your reviewers at the front end of your proposal if it is an alternative session. Um, but um, a couple points maybe just to mention for now. Um, for, this is uh, in particular for folks maybe who um, are unfamiliar with the review process or maybe are um, submitting proposals for the first time. And it's just important to keep in mind that proposals that do receive strong, favorable reviews may not get accepted. Um, as you suspect with any type of conference, there are only a certain number of slots available. Um, and so, so it is quite possible to be crafting and submitting a strong proposal and to receive lots of wonderful feedback, but, there's, but there are, are other factors that go into sort of the decision of what proposals get accepted. So on that note, um, something that I just wanted to go ahead and mention at this point in time is ways that I was trying to examine what tends to help a submission receive higher marks than others. So when you are competing against lots of other strong proposals, what are some examples, some of those areas in a proposal that those that tend to receive the highest remarks receive? And so I just wanted to give some, some reiteration to some of the criteria that were mentioned already. And one is, and so there are three areas that stand out for me as a reviewer. Um, from looking across re uh, proposals across the last few years. One is that um, higher, higher rated um, proposals come when proposals are clearly grounded in relevant scholarship and when that scholarship is cited and when that scholarship is referenced. And there's a direct link between what your goals of the presentation paper are and, this, and, and the citations that you're mentioning. The second one is, when, is, is what Carmen just um, shared with us is 
the opportunity to clearly describe your theoretical framing, your research design and your methodology and to make sure there's a link between those. Obviously, the, the idea here is the easier you can make this for the reviewer, the easier it is for the reviewer to understand your purpose and the significance of your work. And so building the connections between them and having some statements around how they're connected can be incredibly helpful for a reviewer. And thirdly would be making sure that you're very clear in identifying the significance to the field. Um, and so, again, the reviewers are keeping that in mind and where you do that in a proposal, certainly there's flexibility in that, but making sure that there's more than just a single sentence or a single statement around the significance of it is a way, again, that tends to sort of help reviewers attend to that issue and, again, often leads to higher remarks. Um, and in regards to symposium, I think the one criteria that reviewers really give a lot of attention to is the coherence aspect. Um, so those are just a couple, a, a couple of points for now, and I'll jump back in accordingly. Thanks, Lenny. Let's move to Bangi. Uh, Carmen and Lenny, uh, those were not just a couple of you know, <laughs> points. You talked about so many you know, great uh, points. and. Uh, so, but I think maybe uh, I agree with both of you. Um, I would uh, focus on both the methodology and uh, finding sections because relatively those two areas um, are the um, sections that the proposed reviewers would um, emphasize and uh, focus on. And, uh, you know, like thinking of the uh, 1,500 word limit, it is not really easy to describe all the details, you know, about the uh, methods and findings. So that's sort of a tricky part, you know, um, whenever I uh, write in a conference proposal. So I, um, maybe my sort of best strategy is to use um, both figures and tables as many as you can. And uh, if you actually kind of carefully review the uh, course, uh, course for proposal document, um, LRA, it says that um, the word limit is 1,500 words, excluding uh, references, figures, and tables. So, and uh, actually kind of both figures and tables would be helpful for uh, your proposal reviewers to see some, you know, like structured and uh, detailed actually kind of information about your study. So that would be um, my best strategy. And, uh, and another strategy uh, would be having a mock review session by inviting actually your colleague uh, to be a reviewer. So we, you know, Amy and Marcel uh, just actually shared the, all the eight criteria that will be used um, for evaluating your, uh, our proposal. So using those eight criteria, you know, um, we can help each other. Maybe uh, we can get it done by uh, one week before March 1st, the uh, proposal deadline, and we can share each other and actually share, you know, using the one to five or Likert scale um, score and, uh, you know, with some constructive feedback. So I think um, that'd be, uh, you know, great, uh, would be really helpful to strengthen our uh, proposal and revise, revise it. Thank you. And Marcel, did you want to add anything? Um, everyone has shared a lot of what I probably would have said. Um, I want to, to kind of underscore what Bongi just said in terms of having a, a colleague or someone to read, but also just reading your own proposal um, as a reviewer and last year as the co-chair. Um, I, I think, you know, we're literacy researchers. We should proofread our work. So make sure that you read your proposals before you submit. Um, and also um, making sure in terms of clarity, um, you know, avoid using any jargon or terms that are not clearly defined because even though we are all coming with a shared inquiry into literacy, um, we, we come to the work from different um, disciplinary um, lenses and, and so maybe there is some vocabulary if you're gonna to use that language make sure that it's clearly um, defined and articulated and also I would say making sure that you're very um, thorough in a, a discussion of the methodology and um, the findings you know being being able to succinctly kind of detail out you know what is the method and what were, you know, 
those main findings. You might not go into depth in the proposal, but at least being clear about what, what the findings were um, so that someone could easily ascertain that. Um, and, and just back to Lenny's point about the grounded and relevant literature, um, one thing we will be looking at is, is the um, current research, you know, how it extends um, where, we, where we currently are, but also understanding too that there are those pieces of research historic, that may historically ground your work that are important, so theoretically, um, empirically, so um, that, that grounding in research is really important. Okay, thank you. So I do just want to remind you that proposals are due March 1st at 11.59 p.m., not a minute later. And as Bangui suggested, perhaps you could have your proposal written even sooner and have a colleague uh, review it. So now we're going to turn to your questions. I'm going to let Peggy call out questions to us and um, one of our panelists will respond. Okay, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great, we've got five questions and I think one of them was kind of answered. So I'll start and they're also in the chat window for you that are visual. Um, so we have a question, what if your original work is accepted but not published anywhere yet? And I think what this person meant was it was accepted, it's gonna be forth, uh, you know, coming out like late December, right around conference time. Is that okay or should it be completely not published in any form? You know, I think this is interesting because I, I'm sure we all have been to sessions where people present work and they, you know, even in the presentation, cite the work or, or say, you know, reference this or go to this. Um, and sometimes the timing of when, because of the tenure process for many people um, who might be on that track, um, you know, work may have been in, in review. And so I, we understand that it is, um, some of those things are challenges. And I, I know that there are lots of conversations in different circles about this. Um, it should be, this, this is seen as a publication. So in the sense that um, the conference, you don't want a situation where every year someone is presenting on the same work that's already been um, published and they're just kind of recycling the work. And we've seen this at, at other organizations and conferences that we might attend. So you should be presenting original work that has not been published with the understanding that should be the intention. And also with the understanding that there are opportunities um, in the um, literacy research and theory. I can never get the acronym right. Uh, the yearbook, it has a new name now. You can publish, submit your work after in that publication. Um, the Journal of Literacy Research may be, you know, so there, there are stages through which you, you get the work presented. But I think ultimately what we're looking for is that someone isn't in a situation where they're constantly presenting on the same work that's already been presented and published um, year after year, but that they're bringing something new to the table. That's a great, an that's a great answer. Anyone else want to chime in? Okay, um, the next one, I think you already answered it, but I'll read it again just in case something else comes up. It's, what if I am in the middle of data collection but do not have findings yet? Would a roundtable be the best type of session? And so do you want to add anything to that? Um, I, yeah, I, I think you want to wait until you have some preliminary findings. So, um, you know, if it is in the stages where you're still just data collecting and there hasn't been any preliminary analysis, I would say you want to wait until next year or the next conference. Um, but the round table session and the poster session would be a good option for those individuals who are interested in, um, works in progress and getting feedback on work that's in progress but where there's been some preliminary data analysis conducted. Um, I also think that the study groups, if you are part of um, a group where there's a research inquiry, a methodology, let's say you want to be a part of the design-based research um, and to study more and to have some qualified, um, you know, uh, facilitators come and do some work in that area, 
that may be something to think about, to collaborate with others in an area that you may have some questions about, but for work that where there hasn't been some kind of analysis, um, I think you should wait to submit until later, a later time. Okay, sounds great. And then this is kind of a broader question. Could you explain about the alternative sessions? Carmen? I'll have some other folks chime in on that because I know there's right. examples of people who've done. I, I, I went to the to the actual pro, to the actual proposed um, call for proposals to look at the definition. So I'm not um, giving you my own opinion of what it is. So it's, a, it's just one sentence. Is in the is in the call. It's, the, it's 90 minute sessions that are creative alternative in which presenters share their research and engage participants with alternative methods, including theater performance, media, technology simulation, cultural circles, interactive inquiry, and other another alternative. Uh, I, for example, do work on performance and um, I have done set alternative session exploring um, performative methodologies such as uh, slam poetry and I bring people together to do this kind of work and then uh, we, we write a proposal together grounding it in why is this particular approach um, significant why does it matter to literacy research and how it has informed our research and provide examples of how that that looks what that looks like in our work so um so yeah i found it a very a vibrant um format within lra right now sounds good um, yeah i think the the call for proposals has more info on that and you might even look in previous previous um sessions um, can, what one? Oh, go ahead. Did anyone else want to chime in? And um, yeah, I just wanted to add into that that um, uh, often an alternative uh, an alternative session will try and engage the audience in a different way than a traditional symposium. So a question that maybe reviewers have is, what is your session doing, or what is different about your format? than what one might see in a traditional symposium. And so in that case, oftentimes folks who are writing an alternative session proposal also include a methodology in the sense of the format and design that they're going to use to create that particular proposal. And so sometimes there's a methodology that they will be drawing on that incorporates the audience to participate in a certain way. So there's often, and it's a wonderful opportunity to sort of disseminate uh, uh, the presenter's uh, ideas and also though to obtain um, ideas from the attendees in ways that traditional formats don't often afford. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, and it's, what's one thing you've learned you wish you had known before your first proposal? I'll add one thing, um, and Lenny kind of said this earlier. I think understanding that um, there are reasons beyond just it being a strong proposal, that proposals are accepted. And that there are only so many spaces for, um, for the conference um, program. And so there are, unfortunately, some really, you know, there could be some strong proposals that do not get a place on um, the conference program. And so there is a point around coherence, around wanting to have inclus inclusive, but also diverse, uh, topics explored throughout um, the conference program. I think that's really important. Um, but also, one thing that I think is important is just really thinking about the area where you submit to. And some areas get more submissions than others. Um, and really thinking about what's the, what is the one thing that you really want to center or focus or kind of foreground in your proposal and how that connects to the area that you're submitting to. Um, so for example, if my work uh, happens to be with racially, racially and linguistically diverse student populations, that may be the group and maybe it makes sense or you could easily see it falling um, under the area around um, 
diversity, multicultural, multilingual settings. However, um, maybe what really is foregrounding what I'm focusing on for this proposal has to do more with research design and methodology. And I should think about submitting there. So thinking about what it is you really want to focus on for the proposal, for the presentation, um, I think is important um, because that also could be um, a factor in whether or not, you know, if you submit to an area that has a lot of proposals, um, and, and that could be a reason, you know, that you may not get accepted depending on the balance across all of the areas. And I see that Carmen has her has something to add. Yes, um, two, two things that I have learned. Um, the yearbook that Marcel was trying also to remember the, the new title, and I cannot remember. But what used to be the yearbook, um, that handbook is very valuable in terms of seeing how people write papers for the conference, because those are actually the, it's like the, what people usually know as the proceedings. So although the, the, the themes change a lot, <laughs> Um, it would give you a sense of, of how is it that people organize their, their papers and, um, and, and the structures uh, around the conference. The other thing that I have learned and I, and I really appreciate is that you should expect um, pe the people that are going to read your proposal to really know their area. I mean, I, I find, um, although I've never known who reviews my proposal, I'm always amazed at the rigor and the feedback that, that I get, um, so it is very obvious. I know that the people that are reading my proposal are obviously people that are really involved in literacy research. So just, just have that right for that with that audience in mind. Can I say one thing just uh, in terms of the name of the, the name of the yearbook or the journal uh, is the Literacy Research Theory Method and Practice, the L, let me get it right, L-R-T-M-P, five letters. <laughs> so that, that would be an option, we, we, we referenced this, so I wanted to make sure to get it right. Can I just kind of, uh, just one uh, additional advice? Uh, sorry, um, Amy, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know why, but I don't have a raise my hand function um, in my Zoom software, so. Sorry to um, interrupt <laughs> quickly. I just want to echo actually what Master just shared with us. Uh, one year, when I, when I was a doc student, um, I was so passionate about, okay, I'm going to be a first author of uh, you know, my own LRA proposal. So I um, created this proposal, and I thought that it's about, it was about adolescents um, reading attitudes, and I used um, survey uh, methods. So, oh, I thought that uh, it would really fit into Area 7 because my participants were adolescent, but it was rejected. I was, I was like disappointed, but later, once uh, when I shared my proposal with uh, um, some of my colleagues, they, their actually kind of comments were, what about focusing more on methodology and submitted to area 11, not seven. So on the following year, I submitted to area 11, and um, so it was accepted. So um, I would, um, talk to you know different uh, colleagues and ask their experiences uh, regarding each area or I can, we, you know, we can contact um, area chairs and ask you know questions uh, about that. So I'll jump in just to uh, share one piece and that it was trying to learn how to make clearer to the reviewers how to find the criteria in my proposal. So oftentimes, you know, I feel that I, as the writer, right, as the submitter, could identify where the criteria is, but um, I realized by reviewing um, proposals and um, over the years of writing proposals that there are different ways to help reviewers find where, how my proposal meets their criteria. And so um, keep in mind there's a wide variety of ways that, of course, people craft a proposal, but one um, strategy that many will use are subheadings, and they'll create subheadings related to that criteria. And so, I so just to share some examples of subheadings, knowing that there's not a set, a way of constructing these, but sometimes propo proposals will start out with significance and interest to audience, and then include some statements to that, so it's very clear to the reviewer how you're addressing that criteria. 
in that section, um, a writer may there connect to the conference theme or for symposium proposals, then they will create um, a session overview for the symposium or the overall purpose of the symposium. Um, and then sort of, um, I, and then um, include information from uh, subsequent subheadings, such as the significance, the purpose of your study, so what it explores or who's involved, the theoretical framing, the methods and data sources, the findings and maybe findings and significance, you know, if someone chooses to put significance at the end. But that's just one example. Again, there are many formats one can create a proposal, but I think helping reviewers, the easier that you can help reviewers identify how your proposal meets their criteria makes it an easier process and often reviewers um, are able to better assess each of those criteria. Sounds, that's really great advice, everyone. Um, if, if we have another question, if you conducted a qualitative study, what is the best method to discuss your methodology if figures and tables don't tell the full story of your study? I mean, I think you, in methodology um, section, you have to be very clear about naming your qualitative research design. Um, you know, I, I guess I, in a qualitative research study, I wouldn't ex expect it just to be in figures or tables, and I would avoid that, actually. Um, but I think you should name the research design Design what you're drawing from um, and try to summarize because you can't go as in depth because of the 1500 word, uh, word limit. Um, but at least name the research de uh, design, define it, try to give a you know a, a, a solid description um, in the paragraph form. You know, you want to be balanced because again, you only have 1500 words and you have all of the different um, criteria to point to. But if it's qualitative research, understanding who was a part of the study, understanding what, 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 what you did, what you and your collaborators did in terms of research, um, how people um, participated in the study or in the, the project, all of those things should be detailed in the proposal. Um, but again, understanding that you do have limits into, into how much detail you can go into. Anyone else? Um, we have about three more questions, so I'll keep going. And uh, if any of the other uh, presenters want to type in the chat window, if you have additional thoughts, that's great too. Um, okay, so we have, how do we determine which format of presentation would be a good fit for our project? I can jump in on that. I think it goes back to uh, maybe the state of your research as we talked about the round tables and the poster sessions are better for work that has some initial analysis but is still in progress. Um, paper sessions are where most other work will fit. I think um, symposia and alternate for alternative format really are reserved for um, a particular type uh, for a particular need in that area. I wouldn't pr propose something to that area unless you found a, a need or a reason to do that type. And, uh, for the, just to add to what Amy just said, um, you know, for the pay, if you submit an individual paper proposal, the area chairs will work to put papers together um, for a symposium that come together in, in some type of coherent theme or topic. Um, and typically there's a, been a discussant and there will be um, actually a follow-up webinar later that will talk about the role of discussants. If there's a discussant then that will respond to your work as part of a broader symposium. Um, if, again, and, and then if it is you submitting for a symposium, you want to make sure that you are presenting three papers or, you know, 
that come together across institutional affiliations with a discussant in mind who will be able to speak to the work so that, again, that coherence piece is really key. Anyone else on our panel? I was just going to add that one other aspect to consider is the kind of dialogue that will happen around your research. So a poster presentation is going to be able to engage um, attendees in a different way than an individual paper. So in some ways, it depends what kind of feedback or interaction you also want to have related to your research ideas. Whereas something um, like Amy was saying with an alternative format and a symposium, that requires having other collaborators and other partners involved in the, in the design of that. So even though individual papers eventually are compiled and organized into symposium sessions, to submit for alternative format and symposium, it involves having some collaboration in that, I guess, preset in that sense. Great points about organizing behind the scenes. Um, okay, I'll move on for the sake of time. Thanks, everyone. What are the biggest mistakes people make? Um, I think people sometimes, and it relates to the question of, um, of, of findings and, and how to articulate them. I think sometimes people want to go too broad and say everything about about an entire project or, and I think in, in this kind of proposal, you have to be very strategic about, and everything has to, has to tie it together. So you need to be very good at, at finding when you're going in tangents that are not keeping you very, and I, and I used to, to do that and, and, and becoming better at saying, okay, is this really relevant to the point that I'm trying to make in the proposal? I think um, to, Last year, what I noticed, um, people, because of the word limit, not including any references, so not grounding the work in research literature, um, that that's going to be important. So you, you do have to make some choices. Um, the other is not blinding the review. So these are kind of just practical things, but making sure that, um, you know, you take out any references to your identity is important. And generally, um, in all academic, when, you know, if you submit area chairs may send it back and say, you know, before it goes out to review to reviewers, that it needs to be um, a blinded review. But those are, those are some just basic mistakes um, that, I, that I've noticed that people have made. To echo that, uh, those are mistakes though I know we all think will never happen to us because they're mistakes by, by accident. So I know in, in, our, in the area that I co-chair, Every year we have about five, pay, uh, five submissions that um, need to be sent back in for blinding purposes. So it does happen, it's, it happens every year. And similarly, this, this again happens to only a few people, but in the area that I coach here, we always have a few submissions that never upload a paper. So I would say triple check that your paper was actually uploaded and make sure you go back into the system later to, you know, after you submitted it again to make sure it's uploaded. You might even take a picture, a screenshot to show that, uh, that uh, you received the message that it was up uploaded uh, properly. And um, there were individuals in scenarios where papers weren't uploaded that had done screenshots. Again, it was just something that they had on hand in order to show that they that they had um, submitted a paper, but in those cases, it was the system's uh, mistake on, um, on not having the papers fully uploaded. So again, that only usually affects a few people a year, but it is something that happens every year. Great, you guys. Um, so we have our last question of the webinar, and this has to do with theoretical, conceptual kind of papers or proposals. So talk about what criteria there are for proposals that address theory, policy, or issues that don't rep report research, um, maybe don't have method or theory or data analysis. Is reporting research given priority in terms of acceptance? Kind of a two-part question. Um, yeah, yes, I mean, I think there are ways that you can submit um, 
theoretical work or maybe it's a meta uh, review of work that still talks about um, methodological uh, implications, um, you know, even if it is affect, uh, affecting policy, um, there should still be some discussion of the kind of research methodology, even if it's not an empirical study that, um, in the sense that, you know, if you're doing a meta-analysis of research, for example, you're still talking about some overall findings across, across those bo that body of work. Um, I think people should think about alternative formats, potentially, as a way to report on some of these kinds of um, studies. And there's also the category, and Bongi may want to jump in, of other, where sometimes you see work that will go into that area um, because it may be doing something that is slightly different. Um, but this, the significance to the field and the rigor and all of those other criteria still should apply. Yes, I think um, for this type of uh, like more conceptual review of relevant literature or like, you know, related policies, um, maybe submitted to either area 14 other topics or even area 11. Um, so both areas actually kind of relatively, both areas actually focus on the um, sort of newer ways of delivering um, new findings and new discussions rather than like traditional way of uh, kind of evaluating, you know, method or methodology. And I uh, uh, totally agree with you, Marcel, that uh, alternate, an alternative session also kind of can be considered for, this, for these types of um, proposals. I believe that's all we have time for. We're to the end of our hour, but um, I do want to thank everyone for joining. I do want to also remind you that there's part two of the webinar series that is on the roles and responsibilities for proposal reviewers. If you're thinking about being a reviewer, this might be a great session for you to join, or even if you're a seasoned reviewer, it can also be helpful. Um, before we sign off, I just wanna see if Marcel has anything else you wanna add. Um, thanks so much, Amy. I would just add that you can go on to the Literacy Research Association um, org, our website, and you'll also see instructions for how to log on to All Academic 2018. So you do have to, even if you've submitted a proposal in previous years, you have to log on and create a new account for All Academic System, familiarize yourself with that system. You can go on and log on now. Um, and you know, if you can help it, don't wait to the last minute to submit your proposal. Get them in before that 11.59 when the system will crash. Um, but I'd like to just thank Amy, uh, Peggy, Bongi, Lenny, Carmen, and everyone for participating in this discussion. And for all of you that um, registered to participate, it is recorded and it will be archived and available for you to reference at a later date. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.